Okay. I think I think we're going to get back at this. All right. So if you have um, a contact card that you have completed and you've not turned it in to Brittany or Aaron, raise your hand and Brittany will run around and grab one. I see one right here. And also a reminder, um, we would love it if you would complete your um, evaluation that's in the folder that you uh, received when you checked in. So just kind of checking the box as you think about some of the information you've heard today and how we can improve um, programs like this in the future. So that is great. Um, so we are going to turn our attention now to um, building your community and and how do you live well with Parkinson's? And I, I would contend you live well with Parkinson's by connecting with others who are on the same journey to share tips and tricks. So we have assembled today um, a panel of some of our local PD experts who know are willing to, sorry, Bonnie, that's no pressure. So willing to, bravely said that they would lend their, their story to this discussion today. So we're really excited. So I am going to, um, introduce to you um, each person as we go. They'll have five minutes to tell their story. The first person is Bonnie Olson. So Bonnie. Okay, I just read all my notes. Um, I'm, my name is Bonnie Olson. I was diagnosed with Parkinson's in 2010. I discovered um, a problem while I was working um, at the university. Um, I'm right hand dominant and I had to um, write out some instructions for patients um, on their surgery paperwork uh, to send them home and they know what they need to do. Anyway, um, I couldn't write very well and um, when I got done I kind of looked and I thought, I can't read that. A few days later I was home and I was writing on a grocery list and again my daughter came up to me and said, Mom, what's with your writing? I can't read this list. So going back to the U, um, I worked in orthopedic surgery and um, I did a lot of typing, writing out messages and other duties that go along with being a secretary. And um, I, when I tried to write notes um, or directions for my boss, and um, I, it was very embarrassing because I couldn't read what notes I took telling me what I needed to do. So I tried various other things. They, told me, you know, try it on the computer, write out, type out the messages, and so I started doing that, but uh, it got away from me, and um, they were going too fast, so I abbreviated some things, and then I'd go back to write my notes um, so that it was, anybody else could figure out what I was doing, um, but I couldn't remember what the abbreviations were that I wrote down um, to figure out, to fill in the blanks that I had, so it was just a very big problem. Um, I went to my primary care physician and he referred me to a neurologist uh, in Minneapolis. Um, she started me on some medications and stuff and she could not really come down with a stern diagnosis. She thought that it was a little bit more than the familial tremors and she wanted me to look into it further so I was referred to the university. Um, I met Dr. Tewitt um, and he instantly diagnosed me with Parkinson's. My first thought was, oh, sh shoot. <laughs> um, I've been seeing him every six months since that time and sometimes when I go in for my visit things have progressed and we have things to talk about. Sometimes things are very much the same. Um, I could relate with the cognitive skill um, issues that were being talked about earlier um, because mine were deteriorating very rapidly. So. Um, I then had to look at my, my job and I had to retire because I could no longer keep up. Um, at the time, however, one of the advantages of working at the U made it very easy to see Dr. Tewitt because I just had to hop on the shuttle and I was there. Um, I have participated in studies and um, I was, one of them was in yoga. It was just the greatest thing in the world. Um, when with Dr. Tewitt doing the research, he gave me all kinds of different things on a list and asked me if I wanted to participate. And it's like, well, yeah. Um, so it's the the uh, research I feel is so important, and anybody who is in a position to do it, do it. Um, one of the greatest support of this whole thing is Moving Day. 
you meet a lot of people and a lot of opportunities to learn about it, and it is just the most wonderful thing in the world. So if anyone is interested, do it. It's so much fun. It's, I know it's in May, and you never know what the weather's going to be like, <laughs> but take your chance. It's really fun. Um, I, I lost my place. <laughs> um, one, one for the, do, the donation, donating portion of Moving Day, hit up everyone and, any, and anyone that you know, and, and now I'm going to this year get other friends involved as well. It's it's so important, and this year I've I've struck a higher um, goal. I'm it's my goal to make, to raise six thousand dollars this year. The highest I've done two years ago, I reached raised thirty two hundred dollars. Uh, last year wasn't quite as good this past year, but Six grand is it, and I'm going to make it. So, um, Parkinson's is, it sucks. It really sucks. Um, but I'm proud to say that I'm part of the research. It's a proven fact that exercise does indeed slow you down, slow the process of Parkinson's down. I'm a member of LA Fitness and have been for years. I love the basketball court. It's just the best place to be. And the, the best advice that anyone that has Parkinson's, the best advice that I can give to you is just keep on moving. Great. Thank you. That was great. Thank you, Bonnie. Yeah. Okay. Oh, you made it to the right end of the deadline. Nice job, huh? Right? Oh, sorry. Is this on? Yeah. yeah. My name is Janice Smith, and I, I was diagnosed about three years ago. Uh, before that, there were about five years of wondering what was wrong. I was tired. I was no longer able to do what I did before. I had issues with my shoulder, both shoulders at different times. I ended up carrying my arm like this all the time, and I'd put it down and go right back up. Put it down and go right back up. Funny thing, my father used to do that too, but he was never diagnosed, so who knows. Um, and finally, my handwriting, like yours, went wonky, and then there was a tremor. Well, of course, with the tremor, there was something concrete to take for diagnosis. Um, when I was finally diagnosed, I was not at all surprised. In fact, I was relieved because I thought I was going crazy. I thought there was something horribly wrong and that nobody knew what it was and I was never going to find out and it was somehow my fault. So at least there was a concrete thing with a name that I could do something about. So immediately I got my prescription for Carpidopa Levodopa and I got on a plane to Japan. <laughs> And in Japan, I performed the best two-day workshop of my entire career at a nursing school at GK University in Tokyo. And traveled, I traveled all over the island, beyond Tokyo to Kyoto and Kanazawa and Hiroshima. And uh, I'm going back in a couple months, so nice. that'll be my ninth trip. Um, so do I wish there was anything differently? Get myself to Struthers even quicker. <laughs> Um, the neurology clinic where I first went was kind of like a factory and uh, there are a lot of very depressed people in the lobby. Struthers has a very different atmosphere and uh, I found that their embrace made me co more confident that I could handle this. Um, but my pers greatest personal challenge is that I, I have trouble coping that I can't do everything I used to do. I spend a lot of time thinking, well, why can't I do this and why can't I do that? And I have these lists of things to do and they don't get done. And what am I going to do about that? So obviously, more adjustment is required. But I have, over the years, spent many, many, much time in therapy, in Al-Anon, in personal coaching, in spirituality practice, and lots of other personal work. So the old mental issues that used to dog me, the depression, the anxiety, they're so much better now. So I'm much better equipped to deal with this condition. Of course, there's a kind of flatness and apathy, and a little bit of anxiety that comes with Parkinson's. It's nowhere near as bad as the old stuff, um, but it's a different challenge. Um, have I known somebody with Parkinson's? Yes, I think I met someone who was the ultimate 
we don't want to go there case. She couldn't talk, she couldn't walk, she couldn't move. Her, she wanted, she didn't want to eat anymore. Her family wouldn't let her do what she wanted to do because they were afraid of her safety. I think she wanted to die, but they talked her out of it and gave her a feeding tube. Uh-uh, I'm not going there. <laughs> In other words, um, if that does happen to me, I hope that I have more autonomy and more choice than she had. I don't know what became of her, but I saw the worst and I think I, it, it's in some way an ins inspiration to do what I can to not go there. Um, I, I really tried to embrace the community, to learn as much as I can, to go to as many things as I can. There's still a few more things I can do. I'm finally ready to sign up for boxing or Tai Chi or one of the other things. I have been doing a, a lot of exercise, but obviously that's more is needed. And I'm now admitting that medicine has done what it can for me. So I'm very curious to know if there are other alternative treatments that could be useful. Um, they haven't been mentioned today, but I'm going to explore whether Feldenkrais or Jinsen Jitsu or Chinese medicine or maybe more yoga uh, could be helpful to me. Um, so I. Parkinson's has not, has not been a, a terrible thing. It has been a challenge, but it is doable, and um, we, I hope that this panel will, sh will demonstrate some good personal examples of how to cope with it. Thanks. Thank you, Janet. Thank you, Janet. You've already heard from Liz, so mm -hmm. you're next. Ooh. Mary, can you hear me? <laughs> can you hear me? Okay. Oh, good. Well, I you're just the, the pulse point out there. So you already heard from me. So you all these questions, I think you already know them. So I'm going to tell you something new mm -hmm. to make a story out. Um, so my diagnosis story, you heard the part about how I went to a doctor that didn't really know Parkinson's. Oh, thank you. Um, so I'm going to tell you about the elevator after I left the doctor's office, the time that I really got diagnosed. So I went to the elevator, and I got in the elevator, and I looked at the elevator and went, huh. I think they just said I have Parkinson's. That is so ridiculous. I think I'll just go home. I can't believe that this doctor just let me drive home after telling me I have Parkinson's all by myself. I mean, can't even drive. And so, and that was downtown. So I, so I eventually found my way home, and then I think I picked up the kids from daycare and went outside in the yard and hung out for a while and thought I have Parkinson's. Nah, that can't be right. So I looked it up that night, and I looked at all the symptoms, and I went, ah, this doctor nailed it. I do have Parkinson's. <laughs> so I cried a little bit that night. So I you know, did the feel sorry for myself thing. And then I woke up the next day and got, went to work and said, you got to go to work. You got to get up. You got to continue your life, and you got to go to work. And the question was whether or not you tell anybody at work. So I have some friends who never told anybody at work, uh, which is really cool because it's a lot to hide. Um, I think I told one friend and that took care of it for me. I said, you know, I think I have Parkinson's, but don't, I'm not ready to go public with that. Liz, we heard you have Parkinson's! You know, so, that was, then it was all over the place. So, what I did right away after my diagnosis is I told you I hit the couch. So I would go to work and be the best teacher I could be all day, be the best mom I could be at night. Probably wasn't a very good wife. Um, probably would have been a better wife if I could go back and do something again. Uh, my husband does a really good job of taking care of me now. Um, my greatest personal challenge with Parkinson's was having to quit teaching before I was ready to quit teaching. Um, I finagled that by volunteering as a teacher in, a, in my neighborhood school. Um, as far as my greatest personal accomplishment, I'm hoping that that's still ahead. Um, I started a bike group called Pell and Roll for Parkinson's that helps people get on three or four wheels. Uh, so that you don't you know, fall off your two-wheeler and break something and then have to go into nursing care earlier than you should. Um, I also did my own landscaping this summer. I took out rocks and put in mulch and a bunch of plants. And my husband, you know, I saved him $8,000, I figure, right? So now I said, you can build a deck with that? And he says, I'll think about that. I'm going to do it myself. We've been working on a deck for 20 years. <laughs> 
The next question is, do I know anybody living with Parkinson's? I know a lot of really wonderful people who are living with Parkinson's. Um, they're part of the journey, so kind of make new friends, keep the old. You know, I learned so much from my friends with Parkinson's. Uh, they are not afraid to say, hey, Liz, you know, you have been around, time to get your butt on the bike, or time to go do this, or time to go that, do that, or have you seen your doctor lately? You look a little bit like you're struggling. Um, they're great sound, uh, what do we call it? Uh, sounding board, thank you. They're great sounding boards. Um, I also have many friends from my teaching years and from my neighborhood. And I think it's really important to keep your social circle broad. And then how do I hold myself accountable regarding my Parkinson's treatment? Well, like I talked about, those friends. Those friends, the husband, um, and for myself, it's uh, following the doctor's recommendations, even though I might not want to. It's uh, listening to things like, Liz, I think it's time for DBS, even though I maybe don't want to. And it's, um, get off the couch, honey. It's time to go for a walk, which is what the dog says to me. <laughs> so, that's it. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Becky Buckner. That's Becky Buchner. Buchner, thank you. <laughs> yes, uh, I'm Becky Buchner, and I was diagnosed with Parkinson's on October 17th of 2016, almost two, two years ago. And what brought me to the doctor uh, was the tremor in my left hand. I am left-handed, and it was uh, getting, my handwriting was getting atrocious. Um, when my uh, neurologist told me that I had Parkinson's, I was stunned and just sat there stone-faced, uh, which led her to tell me that she noticed I had masked face, which I had no idea what that was. Um, and my husband was with me, and I think he was more upset than I was at the time. I think I was just stunned at, at the moment. Um, she, uh, the doctor ordered some blood work and MRI to rule out other possibilities. We talked about medications, but I told her that I was not ready to start any medication at that time. She gave me a book to read about Parkinson's and um, told me to start taking a B-complex supplement and then told me to come back in six months. Well, I was very ignorant about the disease. What I, the only thing I knew about Parkinson's was that it caused somebody to have tremors. That's all I knew. Um, I started reading the book from the doctor. I bought several other books uh, on my own. I started searching the internet, um, looking for ways to stop the progression, reverse it, or whatever I could do to stop it. Um, what I learned was that several other issues that I'd been dealing with um, were also related to Parkinson's. It's more than just tremors. And um, yeah, I had like all the symptoms. Um, I had a, um, I've experienced just about every symptom that's been listed here today. Um, I've been having pain in my left leg for um, six months before I was diagnosed. I've been going to a physical therapist um, to find out what was the problem with my leg. And I didn't um, even know that it was related to Parkinson's until I started on the carbidopa levodopa. And it, magically improved my leg pain significantly. Um, after my diagnosis um, and after I learned that you don't die from Parkinson's, I told my children and my, um, my sisters right away. Uh, I told my close friends, I told my two bosses at work, but I refrained from telling other people at work that I had Parkinson's. Um, I uh, I received a lot of love and support from everyone that I told, and I feel very fortunate to have um, a large support system around me. My husband, my two boys, um, my daughter-in-laws, my grandchildren, um, they've all been very supportive and helpful. Uh, my daughter-in-law's uh, mother told me about her leader at exercise class, Dirty, um, who happened to be a physical therapist with Parkinson's disease. 
I called Chris and I didn't even know what to ask or what to talk about. Um, she was very helpful and very encouraging and I almost cried talking to her because she was the first live person that I actually talked to that had Parkinson's. Um, and she sounded normal. She sounded, <laughs> she sounded, she sounded great. <laughs> Uh, Chris was a tremendous help for me, and she's the one that invited me to a support group, Women Connect, and to last year's Spring Parkinson's Symposium, where I met her in person for the first time, which is a really amazing story on how I even found her at this big, giant gathering. But uh, I'm very grateful to Chris for all the connections that she's shared with me and many of the rest of you in this room, I'm sure. After my diagnosis, I worked for another 15 months, sticking to my original retirement plan. Um, and I just retired this past January, very happily retired now. Uh, I'm currently taking carbidopa levodopa daily, three times a day. I see my neurologist every six months, and I get some kind of exercise in every day. My exercise of choice is walking. So I, on days like this, I like to get out and walk. On days when I can't, then I um, get on that treadmill. Is there anything I would have done differently? Yes, there's a few things. I would not have hesitated to share uh, my diagnosis with other people uh, rather than trying to hide my symptoms because I only received love and support and encouragement from anyone that I ever told. Um, so it was really quite freeing to just tell people. Um, I would have gone to big therapy um, a little bit earlier than I did. I waited for seven months before I went to therapy and um, that, well, that was good. I, I would have gone to that a little bit earlier and I would have been a little more consistent in my exercise. Um, I know how important exercise is to people with Parkinson's and I know I need to do a better job and be diligent about that. And I know I'm early on in my Parkinson's journey and I have a lot to learn and experience yet. Um, that's why uh, connections to the Parkinson's community are so important to me. Programs like this and having a support group are so helpful and informative and it's been very encouraging for me to see so many people living well with Parkinson's. Thank you, Becky. Chris <laughs> Jurdy. Um, well, you'll have to wave or whatever if I move the microphone too far away because I, mean, I have a tendency to want to read my notes, so I can tell you. Anyway, I am Chris Jurdy, and um, I was working as a physical therapist um, and working at the Minnesota Health Department of Health in a new job. I had been there a couple of months, and I was walking, and I started to limp. My left leg was just sort of dragging, limping. I'm right-handed. And, and, a, and one day I was typing on the computer and my left leg started to bounce. And I was like, what in this? And I was a therapist. I was like, okay, something neurological is going on, but I had no clue what it was. Um, and my arm was fine. It's like, okay, what's going on? So um, in the end, I went to a neurologist who I had everything you could think of. You know, a spinal tap, an MRI, this, that, the other thing, blood tests, and everything was negative. In fact, the MRI, the neurologist had the surgeon on call because he was pretty sure I had a brain tumor because everything else had um, been negative. I didn't know that at the time. It was probably good. But it was a Friday, of course. So I had to wait until Monday. And so they canceled the surgeon, but unfortunately no one told me that. So, um, but the good news was that I didn't have brain tumor. However, we still didn't know what I had. And then finally he said, are you sure that there's not anything with your left arm that doesn't work right? I said, well, no. I mean, you know, you do all the pinch tests and everything, and they were all normal. Move your leg up and down. Those were normal. I walked. I even had an arm swing at that point. And so all of a sudden I said, you know what? There's only one thing that happens. When I get up in the morning and I go in the shower and I start to wash my hair with both hands, I'll go both hands and the left hand stops. And he said, I think I know what you have. And so uh, Parkinson's, and or he suggested it, he didn't make it. 
I think you should go and see a movement disorder specialist, which I did, you know, it took a month or so to get in. And I saw him and he said, you have Parkinson's, come back in six months. I mean, I will tell you that was almost the entire conversation and the whole thing. I cried. He left the room. I saw the nurse saw me crying, but he never saw me crying. I gave him one more time chance, and then on the second time I was like, okay, you're done. Not going back to you. And he was a movement disorder specialist, so I kind of expected more. But um, so then I did some hunting, and um, I was actually quite depressed. I was on no Parkinson medications at that time because the symptoms were still pretty mild. I was still limping around the health department. Um, I did tell my coworkers, kind of bouncing around my notes here, but I did tell my coworkers, but I had just started there. So um, it, they, were, they were supportive and I really didn't know them that well. And we all were in cubicles. I mean, I don't know if you've ever been there, but it, the kind of things that happen there, um, sometimes it's just you have your own job and you don't necessarily have a lot of people around. So as a physical therapist, I always worked in teams. And so here I am in this isolating environment. Actually. And so I, I didn't feel like I had a good support system. Um, I mean, not for their lack, but just by virtue of where I was. And so um, I also had been really active in the Physical Therapy Association in the community, but I was working on a grant project and that was going to end. So I didn't tell the physical therapist friends I had because I was probably going to be job hunting again in a year or two years. And I didn't want to um, jeopardize the fact that I needed, I wanted a physical therapist, the physical therapist job again. And so I didn't tell. Um, I did tell my, of course, my husband and my, my two boys and um, my sisters. And that was kind of the, the network, a couple of friends. That was the network at that point. The only uh, people that I knew who had Parkinson's, actually I should say I, don't, I didn't know anyone personally at that point, but the only experience I had had was when I worked in a nursing home and I had worked with a couple of people with Parkinson's, but they were at end stage, and it also was at least 20 years ago. So, you know, it wasn't anything up to date. So, um, let's see, where are we going here? So anyway, I, I was quite depressed. That's really, I internalized it for several months, mostly doling it up on it on myself. Went to a psychologist, spent time with her, just figuring out what to do. She was the one who actually suggested a nurse uh, practitioner that she worked with in the mental health field, who knew a physician, who, a neurologist, who also had been a pharmacist before he became a neurologist. <laughs> and so, I went to see him, and he was wonderful. He, he put me on, if you, selegiline or the equivalent, and so that immediately my mood was much better. Um, I was actually, you know, like kind of bouncing off the walls after a little while, the amphetamine effect. Two years I had to change that, but anyway, it was kind of like, I felt good, and then, then, then he was not able to work anymore. He had a medical issue, and so I had to work again. And this time I found a, a comprehensive clinic and I went there and that was actually really good. When I started the Carbidopa Bibidopa, I was like, I'm back! <laughs> <laughs> and finally, it feels so good to just be me. And um, that was the best thing. And I have to say that, you know, I, I Carbidopa Bibidopa has my vote. Granted, there'll be other issues along the way, but that was great. Um, so, a couple of things I did on the way. I did actually know a person who worked for one of the Parkinson's Foundation chapters in Minnesota, and I called them for information. They happened to be a physical therapist, and I called and I cried. I mean, I, and then I found the women's group, um, Ruth Lasser was leading that one, and I went there and talked, and I cried. I mean, it was just good to just be able to let you, you know, to be able to say how sad I felt to have this diagnosis. And it took a while before I finally realized, you know, people people don't die from this disease. They live with this disease, and it is a, something we live with, not something that is going to kill us. And it took it just took me a while. To actually, of course, I suppose the sledgeling helped to have a little bit of an upper there. <laughs> um, so, OK. 
Okay, so but I avoided the Parkinson's community overall, and I also avoided the support groups because it was mostly men. Mm -hmm. And not that I dislike men, but they tend not to talk. I'm like my husband would let you know I'm a verbal processor, so he I don't want him to give me an answer. I want him just to listen, or at least pretend he's listening well enough <laughs> that he's really listening. And so, um, and he said he took me 20 years, but he figured it out. So we've been married 46 years now, so he's still doing well. But um, <laughs> anyway, so sorry, I have to check my notes for a second. Um, anyway. Yes. The greatest personal challenge, um, I think, was the point of re realizing that this is not bad news, it's actually good news that it was Parkinson's and that I can move forward. And my greatest personal accomplishment in the process was taking the big certification as a PT and taking the power certification as a PT and really understanding how much better I felt that I could smell better. I mean, not, not personally, probably. <laughs> <laughs> My sense of smell improved and the sense of taste and improved. And, and I was just happier when I was exercising. And then I had the greatest privilege of applying to attend the women's conference sponsored by the Parkinson's Disease Foundation before they merged with the Parkinson's the National Parkinson's Foundation, and now they're PF. You know. We got married. That's what we call yeah, that. We got married. It's hard to explain that in that sort of way. So um, it's a good thing. But I was able to attend. There were 25 women in New Jersey, and I was the only one from Minnesota. Um, and there were other women who were on the board for the National or for the PDF, and they presented and they talked about things like intimacy. They talked about medications, side effects, how they felt about having Parkinson's, things that they would like to have. One of the people there was Robin Morgan. She's the former editor of Ms. Magazine from New York. And um, some other people who were very involved with um, the different Parkinson's or facilities that have Parkinson's specific programming around the country. And it was just very stimulating and exciting. And I came home and I thought, well, part of it we got tasks with trying to spread that out. But I realized being with other women and talking about how we felt and our emotions and just how we dealt with things was really helpful and made me feel good. And that I wanted that to continue. I needed it here. And um, I also went to Tucson, Arizona in the winter and I needed it there. So we have groups that do me still working on trying to make it a better group because I don't think I'm the best person to always um, coordinate that but it's happening and we meet quarterly um, here in Minnesota but it's been great so thank you great. thank you Chris. so we have a few questions I think for our panel and I, and I want to start out with the first question which was um, and you met you all shared as you were speaking about your story you know, who you told first. And I think we would all agree that you can tell someone about your diagnosis, but that's not the same as seeking support from someone. So who did you turn to for support? And um, are, you, are you satisfied with the support systems that you've created? So answer that. Uh, as I mentioned, I got myself over to Struthers Parkinson's Clinic as soon as I could and I found that their embrace was a, a great support um, but the thing that I'm realizing now is the motor symptoms have been addressed more or less it's the non-motor symptoms that plague me and that I don't know any what to do about it's the fatigue the apathy the lack of sleep especially the lack of sleep the constipation a, coupled with flatulence, the stiffness, the trouble with handwriting, and so on. I also think there's an interaction with postmenopausal symptoms like uh, hot flashes. And there seems to be nobody who is able to address those symptoms. Um, and um, sometimes you get sympathy for it, and sometimes you get a few suggestions, but no real answers. So I'm, what I would like to work on and find ways to address is how to 
find some strategies to work on the non-motor symptoms. Um, the who do you turn to for support? Definitely the other women with Parkinson's that I know. I mean, I've known, well, actually, everyone except Bonnie I know up here. But um, Liz has been really good at the pedal and rolling. But also that I go into the power gym in Arizona in the winter is one of the, three times a week is one of the best things that I have done. And I feel like it's an investment in me. It's actually an investment in us. And so um, that's been really a good thing for me. Anyone else? I've got another question. Okay. So um, how, is have, how has having a support system or network of friends, people with, people with PD helped you live well? So how does that help? I'll go first since I have the mic. It keeps me going and it makes me be, have exercise. I always struggle finding the exercise that I like the best. I'm kind of fussy, on, but um, I was teaching it and that's what I want is the one I was teaching. But I'm not teaching it now, and I haven't found it yet. But it makes me keep looking, and that's all. Um, I would say our, our women's support group has, has been the, the best for me. It's, we we uh, sit around the table. We maybe start out with exercise or dance or something first, but we end up in a discussion uh, around the table and talking with other women and how they, the issues they're dealing with and the way that they're managing it is very informative, very helpful. And so that has been a great support to me. I, I love our women's group. I feel like I should say something. Um, but I don't know what, I don't know what to say. Or you can answer the next question. <laughs> okay, Angela, I'll answer the next question. It's your choice now. <laughs> Have you advocated for me to read it? Have you advocated for yourself about your Parkinson's journey? That one? Sure. So how have you advocated for yourself? Um, I think you're a great example. I mean, you, you shared already with us the pedal and roll. Yes. Right? Well, and the story behind that was that my nasty brother kept coming over to my house to get me and saying, you need to exercise every day. And then after I figured out that it was really helping me, I said, we have to spread this around. And I don't think that there were as many exercise opportunities at that time as there are now. Now there's just exercise opportunities in every corner, which is nice to see. And that's but then the foundations work, really, mm -hmm. is to get that out there. Um, you know, I like to think that I stand on the shoulders of the people who came before me. And so what I, what I hope comes out of this today, and this kind of ties back into the first question, what would you like to improve about your support group, is getting more people involved and getting more people to, uh, to be part of something in their smaller community. Because every person that you show an example to of living well or that you get involved in this, effort to better understand and be aware of Parkinson's the closer we get to making things better for everybody. Whether or not a cure is on the horizon, if we can live well and have happy lives, then, then we win. So I advocate because I have a loud mouth. Chris? Or, or. One of the things that um, I want to echo that everyone I've told about my Parkinson's diagnosis has been very supportive. But I find that I don't want to play the Parkinson's card too often. I don't want to be typed as, well, she can't do this, or, or, or all the things that could come with the image of having a, a condition. So I, I'm careful about when I bring it up. And when I bring it up, I try to do it as normally as possible. It's just another thing in life. Um, so um, I guess I'll say one more thing. My psychotherapist has been extremely supportive to me in helping me strategize. What do I, what do, I do next? How do I handle this? And um, um, the psychologist piece is not always a part of the care team, but I think it's important to go out and find one and add him or her to your care team. Thanks, Janice. No? Um, when I first found out that I had Parkinson's, I think everybody goes through this. Every once in a while, you have your pity party. And I was just talking to a new friend that I met today, and she told me a very good exercise to do. It's not physical, but it is mental. Get a journal and write down at the end of the day your happy thoughts from the day. Don't do the negative stuff. Stick with the happy stuff. And I think it's really important to do that 
and realize how lucky we are. There's always somebody who's got it worse than we do. But if you write down the happy stuff right before you go to bed, it'll hopefully make for a better morning for you as well. So thanks for that. Thank you. Thanks. Um, well, our final section is um, what words of wisdom do you have for as we kind of close this part part out? I mean, keep moving. Yeah. That's all there is to it. Keep moving. Every journey through Parkinson's is unique, so I cannot know what my future is. I may progress slowly or quickly through the disease. I may sicken and die from something completely different. I know that there's a limited time to do what I still want to do, and it's hard to plan for the big things, mostly travel, while at the same time coping with the day-to-day -day angst of what I can and cannot do this very minute. I want to get to the end, feeling, uh, end of life feeling that I've accomplished what I set out to do and have tied up the threads that are still hanging. I want to be who I am without fear and at the same time exude kindness and care for others. I want to prepare for the worst but anticipate the best of what is yet to come. My personal opinion is that I acquired this condition because there was way too much stress in my life from birth through midlife that I did not know how to navigate. And my hope now is that the time remaining to me is infused with love and overflowing with opportunities for attaining wisdom. Some days are good, some less so, but I remain hopeful that life has still more to offer. Sorry. Amen. <laughs> Find joy. Get connected and stay connected with the Parkinson's community and the Parkinson's group. <clears throat> Be proactive, you are in charge. I mean, I don't give you that as a burden, or even for myself, but that if your doctor tells you to do something, you can do it, but if it doesn't work well, you have, it's your responsibility to go back and say, this is not working, or it's, you know, I'm having this, this is the way, it, because you're, you're, you are the only one who knows. And I said in a positive, so be proactive, and live with your Parkinson's, don't, Sort of fade with it. Um, and then also join us at the next Women Connect group meeting um, on November 3rd at Woodbury Lutheran. It's a Saturday from 1230 to 3. Um, anyway, it's in Woodbury. So if you want my the information or to be added to our email list, please see me after. Great. Thank you all. Thank you. Okay, wow. Um, that's a lot. <laughs> so, um, thank you all for sharing your stories um, and words of wisdom. Um, I think, so I always think about my mom. My mom's motto is count only the sunny days. So, and I know some days are not always sunny, but I think we can all find a little bit. So, so what have, we, what have we talked about today? What have we heard from both Dr. Arayek and, and Susan Gould? And um, you know, what, is, what is known about women in Parkinson's disease? Well, we're learning now that there's a, women are at a lower risk of developing Parkinson's, that we are more likely to report certain Parkinson's symptoms like fatigue, which I find fascinating. I mean, how many of us have an overflowing to-do list? Um, more likely to experience large changes in their symptoms from even small medication changes, with dyskinesia being the most frequent reported side effect. That's um, from, and as we started telling the Parkinson's story as a out in community a lot, people are very familiar with the work that Michael J. Fox has done by putting a face on Parkinson's and that dyskinesia. I mean, how many of us remember that first interview he did where he was a nightly news show and he purposefully didn't um, take his medicine so that he could be dyskinetic? That, you know, that's kind of what people associate Parkinson's and is Parkinson's with, but there's so much more as we've talked about today. Um, women are less likely to receive deep brain stimulation, less likely to be cared for by a Parkinson's specialist, and less likely to access medical care for their Parkinson's. So again, I think not having the language to describe the symptoms and what they're associated with 
I think that's part of the problem with women not being able to get the care that they, so uh, that's so important to, the, to managing the disease. So women in Parkinson's teams um, have come together under the Parkinson's Foundation. I'm very grateful to the conversation started by Chris Jurdy about the women, um, the women talk. We, we refer to it as the Women and Parkinson's Disease Initiative. And it is the country's um, first national effort to address long-standing gender disparities in, the Parkinson's, in Parkinson's research and care. And this education program is a continuation of the information shared in the Women in PD talk teams to advance learning and knowledge, always called TALK, <laughs> um, acronyms, which has, led, well, which has been led by the Parkinson's Foundation and funded through the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute, which is actually a part of the, um, the Affordable Care Act. So those are some of the outcomes that have been established since that, since that legislative initiative. <coughs> so with this information, um, we are really continuing to spread awareness around, around women and Parkinson's. Um, and we're addressing the issue by this, in January of 2019, we will, be in, we will be positioned to disseminate a research and care agenda, the first of its kind, that is driven by unmet, unmet needs and priorities collected at these regional forums. So way back in April, there was a collection of women that, that met at the Struthers Parkinson Center, and they talked very openly, much like we did today, about their concerns about living with, with Parkinson's and the gaps that they were incurring or seeing as they were trying to manage their, manage their care treatment. And also they, provide, they were also um, very often accompanied by their care partner. So the care partner could also lend his or her voice to the challenges that their partner was experiencing in finding best possible care. And then in October, October 19th actually, we are gathering um, people in, is it Aaron Houston? Houston, Texas, um, where we will bring women together in, uh, with, that are living with Parkinson's and health professionals to prioritize the issues and discuss, that were discussed at the regional forums and create, an act, create action items to address the issues. So this information that will be shared October 19th will then be bubbled up in January with a finer, final research agenda. So all really exciting things, very real-time um, progress, and I think we all need to be very excited about that. So what one other outcome we wanted to set forth today is how we can empower you as women living with Parkinson's and get you connected. Women's, women Connect is a great example of a volunteer effort uh, organized by volunteers. Chris Jurdy's put it together. We're coming together on November 3rd in Woodbury. We recognize there's an opportunity for other groups like that. The Parkinson's Foundation can certainly support um, as people want to build uh, community events and community connections, we have a support group facilitators handbook that ha that's available through our office. And we have, as we've talked about over the day, we've, we've, we have a significant number of resources available online that can be used to drive content and discussion. So say you want to have a viewing party for the next uh, education event, you could certainly host that in your home, invite other women that you know that have, are living with PD, and that's the first starting point. It's planting the seed for further engagement. Because I think the common thread I heard from the ladies up here is that isolation is not is not an option to live well with Parkinson's. Chris, would you agree? Yeah, that, that was one of my biggest issues. When you don't tell anyone, yep. you're isolating yourself, and I did. Exactly. So, and then it gets a cycle of anxiety and depression and apathy. So we all know those pieces. So, Erin, program manager. Is there anything you would add as we send our friends off today? We have some good information at the back. Um, as the first bullet points out, we want to spread the message. So I've printed lots of women in Parkinson's fact sheets. So if you have friends, family, you couldn't be here. Brittany's got the whole stack. These are also available online. You can download, print them off, have your own copy. Great. That was my next comment. I was going to remind you of the evaluation. Please take a moment to complete the evaluation while I thank our sponsors once more. If you haven't turned in your contact card and you have filled it out, raise it and Brittany and Erin and I will run around and grab them because there's a fabulous drawing coming. Here's, we've got one from Janice. Um, and then thanks to our annual chapter partners, Abby, Abbott, Acadia, Impacts, Lundbeck, and Living Well, Home Health, Parkinson's Specialty Care, and of course today's other partners, the education partners, 
Atomus, Boston Scientific, U.S. World Meds, and Medtronic. Uh, 